Reverend clergy, brothers and sisters in Christ, glory to God on this first Sunday of Great Lent. The 21st century is unmistakably being shaped as a visual culture unlike any previous era. Images compete for prominence in every walk of life. The right optics are essential in business and in politics, and many individuals likewise create a self-image for their social media with impressions that often bear no resemblance to their true self. But on this day, the first Sunday of Great Lent, known as the Sunday of Orthodoxy, the Church offers another more profound way to understand images. This day is the day of the icon, the day that celebrates the restoration of the holy images to the Church. And the icon always conveys actual truth, never a manufactured or photoshopped pretense of reality, but the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ in form and color. It is also a day that commemorates the work of the Seventh Ecumenical Council in restoring not just images, but a vision of reality to the church, restoring a vision of the real Jesus to the Orthodox Christian world. Now, many Orthodox Christians regard icons with profound devotion. For example, I knew only one of my grandparents, Mayaya Padiskevi, and I was also named after her, and we share the same patron saint, Padiskevi of Rome. I have only a few photos of Mayaya, who was born in the late 19th century in Greece, and they hold great significance to me. When I see her smiling eyes in those photographs, I'm transported back to the cherished time I spent with her as a young child. Those photos serve as powerful reminders of her boundless generosity, infectious sense of humor, and especially the unwavering Christian faith that she exemplified and the love and care that she showed to me and my sisters. I cherish those photographs because of what she still means to me. Icons, in a way, like photographs, are pictures of people we love, preserving their memory, but also allowing us to connect with a memory of their presence. As her only namesake, I inherited from Mayaya a 19th century painted icon of St. Padiscavi of Rome, a second century Christian great martyr. The term great martyr is a designation given to individuals who endured severe and brutal tortures for their faith in Jesus Christ. St. Padiscavi was arrested and tortured for refusing to deny Christ and refusing to worship idols. Her unwavering devotion to Jesus Christ led to the conversion of many to Christianity. So while I treasure the icon of St. Padiscavi, the significance goes far beyond its old age and association with my beloved grandmother. My attachment to the icon stems from the profound honor and affection that I hold for St. Padiscavi herself, a strong and faithful Christian woman who refused to deny Jesus Christ despite suffering unspeakable horrors. I think of her as a member of my family, in fact. Very simply, the love and reverence that Orthodox Christians like myself have for icons of Jesus Christ and his righteous followers is attributed simply to our deep affection and reverence for the individuals depicted in them. Following the early 20th century Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, when the new Soviet Union began persecuting Christianity and destroying churches, Orthodox Christians literally buried their icons under the ground rather than see them destroyed by the atheist state. And after Christianity again became legal there, the icons were unearthed and restored to their proper places in homes and in churches. In fact, when the Yaroslavl Art Museum was moving to a new building in 1977, they discovered 80 icons buried under a layer of dirt at that location. Orthodox Christians are surrounded by icons or holy images in their churches and even in their homes. Yet we might not always appreciate why they are important and what icons offer to us. Not only a vision of the biblical accounts, but a vision beyond them into the kingdom of God. Since the earliest centuries of Christianity, biblical events in the life of Jesus Christ have been portrayed visually and utilized by Orthodox Christians for personal devotion, for instruction, and in worship especially. And this long-standing practice was widely accepted within the early church until the early 8th century, when doubts surrounding the use of icons began to emerge. Various religious and socio-political factors in the Byzantine Empire at that time converged as something like a perfect storm. The two main sides of what became a major controversy were identified as iconoclasts, literally icon smashers, and iconoduels, or iconophiles, those who supported the creation and use of icons in prayer and worship. Ultimately, the iconodule position prevailed in the church, but not without a great deal of turmoil and persecution and bloodshed. Emperor Leo III, known as the Asaurian, 
stood at the eye of the storm of iconoclasm, presumably influenced by the prevailing ideology of Islam that prohibited the depiction of living beings. In the year 730, Leo issued an edict denouncing icons as idols and ordered the destruction of thousands of icons, beginning with the icon of Jesus Christ on the Chalki Gate leading into his palace. Iconodules who openly objected to his extreme measures were subjected to brutal arrests, torture, and exile. And after Leo's death, his son, Constantine V, continued the persecution of iconodules with great fervor, even to the point of executing 16 iconodul martyrs in 766. And I mention this to underscore the sacrifices made for orthodoxy, lest we think that the debates about icons were merely academic conferences. They were not. So we also call this day the triumph of orthodoxy, but it is not a return to a particular custom. In other words, how nice we've restored the lovely tradition of icons. It was so much more, as the martyrs attest. On this day, we commemorate a restoration not only of icons, but of the proper, orthodox, correct understanding of the Savior whom we worship. Without a correct understanding of the God whom we worship, we're in big trouble. Much more than a debate about images. The iconodules insisted that those who opposed icons had a flawed view of Jesus Christ and misunderstood his incarnation. What's more, they said, a proper understanding of Jesus would not only support the creation of icons and their use in personal devotion and in worship, but would make them essential in expressing the Christian faith. One argument of the iconoclast was that the creation of an image depicting Christ's human nature could lead to idolatry as the worship of a created object. And an opposite iconoclast argument was that an image portraying Christ's divine nature would be blasphemy, since it was argued God is immaterial, God does not have a body. And both arguments fail for the same reason, because any image of Jesus Christ in an icon would be an image of his whole person. The human Jesus, whom St. John says was seen and heard and touched in his first letter, was also the fully divine logos of God that he talks about in his gospel. St. John of Damascus agreed with the iconoclast. Yes, it would indeed be impossible to depict a formless and immaterial God, but God was no longer formless and immaterial. He says, God is now seen in flesh, in the flesh conversing with men. So it would now be possible to create an image of the God whom I see. And further, St. John of Damascus writes that our God is one who wanted to be viewed. The Iconodule Empress Irene convened the seventh and final ecumenical council in 787. And the fathers of this council didn't add any new teachings. They mainly focused on how the previous councils described Christ's incarnation, especially the fifth century council at Chalcedon, that Christ's human material nature and his divine immaterial nature are a hypostatic union that cannot be divided or separated from one another. They also declared that when St. John the Evangelist writes that the word of God became flesh, it was real and not just imaginary. And therefore, icons are, quote, quite in harmony with the history and the spread of the gospel. So after they established the dogmatic position that the creation of icons was appropriate because of Christ's incarnation, the council offered further instruction on how icons should be used in worship and displayed in the holy churches of God on sacred instruments, on vestments, on panels, on walls, in houses, and public byways. They also determined that the holy images may receive respectful veneration or honor, but not worship, because worship is paid only to God. They clarified that any honor paid to a holy image, such as with offerings of incense or with candles, goes beyond the actual image to the prototype. In other words, the icon is nothing but a board with paint, but it offers something like a window to the holy person or event being portrayed. And finally, the council declared that the holy images were to be given the same honor as the four written gospels because they proclaim the same truth. Therefore, what has been handed down to us through the generations is that it is appropriate, possible, and even necessary to be able to see the gospel of Christ through holy images. So what does all of this mean for Orthodox Christians today? Well, because icons are still very much misunderstood as idols in the Western Christian world, it is essential from an apologetic point of view that Orthodox Christians should understand and be able to explain why icons are indeed holy images, not only proper, but essential to the Christian life. And also, unlike the manufactured optics of the 21st century visual culture, 
the icon conveys the actual true way of seeing the world because it is the actual true way of seeing Jesus Christ, the creator of that world, the one who took on matter himself in order to save us. But icons are all about relationship and encounter, as with my relationship with my patron saint, Padre Scivi. She is a role model for me of one holding fast to Christ despite all challenges, and her icon reminds me of that. In the icon, Jesus Christ, the prophets, the apostles, and the saints, they gaze at us. As we contemplate the meaning of their experience in the icon, we also encounter a spiritual reality of our own. The portrayal in the icon broadens the perspective to include us, the viewers, the worshipers, as potential recipients of the same gifts offered by Jesus Christ to the faithful portrayed in the icon. So this day, the triumph of orthodoxy solemnly recalls the church's victory over the iconoclast heresy and remembers all those who fought for the Orthodox Christian faith in word, in writing, in teachings, in suffering, or in godly living. We should remember this day as our sacred duty to stand firm in our Orthodox faith, supplied with the strength that comes from Jesus Christ and his holy Orthodox Church. Thank you.